So uh, probably that's because I did not hit share screen. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, hopefully. Okay, now, now it works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So that was a very, very bad on my side. Sorry. Uh, you should be, uh, I didn't just two slides. Right? Okay, so this were <laughs> starting slide, and then this was the second slide. Okay, so let's assume we were making a few commits, right? and then at some point, somebody decided from this point in, in time in history, so on C2, to create a new branch. And, and this has happened somewhere here. So I was here, somebody created a branch and decided, okay, now I have a new idea. I want to check that, I, that that idea works. So you start committing on that branch. And in the meantime, somebody else has published things on, on, on the same, on the master branch and they went ahead. Okay. So the idea is that at some point you would like to, uh, you know, things have a life of their own. So you keep working on your idea while people working on the master branch, maybe, you, your co-author is working on some, some section of a paper and you're working on another section of the paper. So you, you're, you're here and the guys over there. And at some point you would like to go forward and do a merge on the master branch. Okay? And there's two ways of doing that. So one way is the, the, the way of the brave, which is I don't care, I don't give a, sh I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't care how the graph looks like. And I don't care whether there's mixture of histories going back and down. I don't care about what is the actual logic behind the things. I just do merge and I keep merging the branches everywhere. And this is a, the result. The result of this is something like, like that, right? So uh, histories follow on, on, you know, on a parallel line. And then at some point you merge the histories between this idea and that, and that and and the main branch of your of your of your program or your work is done. Okay, so this idea here works very well if you're alone developing, and you don't really care too much about debugging, and you're really confident that life is very easy for you and you never encounter problems. Okay? In real life, this is usually a bad idea. Meaning, if you are committing things onto a larger project, typically what you would like to do is you would like to make the merge commit from the top line of the history, either from here or vice versa. If you want to go on this direction, you want to make sure that everything that is being, uh, that is being produced follow a linear line as much as possible. Okay? So in principle, Git does not allow you to do that because in principle, Git writes things uh, immutably inside those commits. So in, immutably, those are fixed, they are there, and you cannot change them. So the merge commit is the original uh, thoughtful process of people using Git at the origins. And if you think about that, it's the standard way to do it because of the fact that you know commits are immutable. However, if you're working on a large project with a lot of co collaborators, this is not always a good idea. So what you do, you need to be able to rewrite history. And as we said, we don't rewrite history, but we write alternate history. So what happens if you want to do that, obtaining the same final result, so the, same, the result in the end is the same from the point of view of the code or the document, it doesn't really matter. But what, what, what you want to do is you, you can actually change the way you, look at history, for example, by rebasing master on top of the idea branch. Okay, so you could do that if you wanted. So the idea would be to take these modifications, C3 and C4, and apply them, instead of applying them on C2, you apply them on C6. Okay? Now, naturally, if you do that, this C3 and C4 would not be the same as C3 and C4, in terms of SHA-1 commits. And in fact, they've called them C3 prime and 3C4 prime. So from the point of view of the content, it's the same. So C3 and C4 would just contain the differences between what happened here between this in, in this edge that is connecting C2 and C3. Okay? However, they are identified differently because they start from a new, a new, part, a new part. So the resulting thing would be this. Okay? So you would have at the end, master that lives based on top of idea. Never ever do that. I show this, but don't do this. So the usual way to do this is 
you take your idea, you rebase this on top of master, and we will see how this happens. And if you, if you do that, uh, then the, the, the thought process would have been exactly the opposite. So you go from C3, C4, so, so you still do keep C3, C4, and put C5 prime and C6 prime on top of C4. The outcome at the end is exactly the same. So the code that you would have at the end here, or the document that you would have, would be the same that you have here. But the history in this particular case would be linear. Okay, so let me uh, show you this. And why is it important to have a linear history? Question, do you know why? Why it's uh, preferable, not important. It's preferable to have linear history. Do you have ideas of why this could be very useful? Afterwards, I can do a merge with the fast forward. Uh, yes, but uh, doing merge and master with fast forward is usually forbidden. <laughs> so on master, usually you never do fast forward merges. So you always do a non fast forward merge to preserve the history of, of, the, uh, of the changes with respect to the branches. So if you know that you've worked on a branch and you want to make sure that this is preserved, then uh, from one commit to the final, you don't want to have the entire history in master of what has happened on the branch, you just want to have the, the starting point and the end point. And so you have both paths. You can follow the master path and the master path would go from C2 to C4 radically. Or you have a um, alternate path that actually shows you the history on the branch itself. We will see all of these details very much with examples today. So don't worry if you don't understand what I'm talking about. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, it's normal. We will try to understand all of this and we will try to make sure that you understand all of this and you can actually use all of this. Uh, can I have a question? Yes. You are saying we do that because history is erased if we do merging without. Uh... No, 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 no. So, what I'm saying is that these two approaches, so the merge approach and the rebase approach, okay. they produce the same type of result at the end from the practical point of view. What the rebase does. It's uh, basically, you don't remember anymore what has happened in C3 and C4. So this is a dead branch. It doesn't go back to master. Okay. But you reproduce the changes that are in here in C3 prime and C4 prime. So you write alternative history. You don't rewrite history. So you don't rewrite C3 and C4. They are immutable. They are still there. You can still access them. You can still get here if you know the SHA-1. So you can still get exactly to where you were before, you can still find the path in history that led you to this point. Okay? So what you do when you do a rebase, you're creating a new series of commits, which is in the same number with the same commit message of those guys over here, if you want, or maybe you can change the commit messages or you can squash more than one commit and put all of them together. You can do a lot of things, but the idea is that you want to make sure that you start off from the, the latest version of your master branch. Uh, so this picture is misleading. So I would not use this picture today. So this is a, I've taken from somebody else's slides. I would have never done it this way. I'll show you what is the correct way to do it later on. But think about this as you want to maintain as, as linear as possible history in time. The reason for this is the following. Git has a lot of power, powerful tools to identify when something has happened. So assume, for example, that you figure out that there is a bug in your code, but you have no idea why the bug is there or when the bug has been introduced, but you are sure that at some point in history, things will work. So the way to understand what has introduced the bug and where the problem is, is, okay, I make a bisection algorithm, individuate exactly the point in time, one point in time where things are working. You know that now things are not working create a small program that returns true if everything is okay and false if everything is full, it is not okay. And tell Git, tell me what is the commit in which things start to become false. And this is called Git bisect. The name is what it says on the box. Git bisect tells you, you know, go do bisection. So this is a very efficient way to find and to locate the place in which you introduce the problem in your code. 
And if you manage to do that, this becomes extremely fast if your user is linear and extremely slow if your user is not linear. And so this one of the main reasons to do that is precisely for this. So if you have a master branch that has a linear history, it's very simple to locate the branch that introduced the bug and the commit that introduced the bug because you have a linear history. If you don't have a linear history, so the thing is, once I've gone to the idea, I could keep committing on the branch idea and then merge it back, back into master. Okay? That, it's, it's equivalent from the point of view of master what has happened. It's not really a problem at the end uh, as far as the code is concerned. But if you ever have issues, if you ever have troubles and you want to identify where things started to happen, then you really end up with a lot of messy things. Um, yes. Question. yes. So last time you said that uh, with merges, you can have conflicts that you yes. have to solve manually. Right yes. So what if this is the case and you replace? It's the same. So you would get exactly the same type of message that you get in the merge uh, in, in the merge case. Yeah. So the rebase uh, is basically try to apply C3 and C4 on top of C6. C6. Okay? And if that doesn't make any, com any, any conflict, you're good to go. So the problem here, so the, oh, not the problem, but the, the nice thing about the rebase case is that the, uh, the conflicts are individuated on the earliest commit rather than on the last commit. Okay? So that also helps you because, for example, if you introduce a conflict in C5 with respect to C3 and you do a merge, the conflict would not be uh, resolved from on, on C5. It would be resolved on C7. Okay? So you have a conflict here, which you bring forward on C6, and then you resolve it on C7. But with the rebase, you are forced to resolve the conflict at this level. So the rebase will stop and tell you, you cannot go ahead, resolve your conflicts. Once you resolve your conflicts, you can rebase minus minus continue, and you can do that. So the history here really reflects what happens in the code. Well, on this on this on the side, you would have the final commit on C7, but you would have a lot of things in conflict between these two branches. Okay. If you introduce a conflict in that. Yes. Is it like a good strategy to rebase often in order to not diverge too much from like yes, it is a very good strategy. So the essential part of rebasing is that rebasing should be done on master. So you should rebase your branches on master, not the only way around. So there is there, there is always have to be, there should always be a branch, which is the master branch or the main branch, which is the let's so called the ground truth for everybody. So everybody that merges onto the master branch must be careful about what they do. Okay. You do not want to rewrite the master branch history because if you do that, everybody else has to download the new version of the master branch history. Okay. What, what happens here is that after, if you, if you look at this particular case, uh, the difference between this point and that point is that the code looks the same, identical, but if you, had, if you had done a merge on master on your machine and somebody else has done a rebase on master on some other machine, then these two would not be compatible and you would not have the same history on your two repositories. So somebody would have to say, okay, I choose I pick yours or I pick his. So whenever you do a rebase, make sure you do a rebase only on branches which are yours, on branches that you have full control on or on repositories on which you have full control. So if you try to do a rebase of the master branch of the Linux kernel on top of your development, Linux so what, would kill you. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> you will get flamed probably for hours and hours on the, on the, on the forums, okay? Okay, so let's go to the examples. Before we go to examples, we have to understand how we are going to do this type of thing. So we are going to be using Git repositories which are local on our machines. So there will be a local copy of the repository that we talk about on our machines and remote repositories. Okay, so remote repositories is just means it's a Git repository. So there's a subdirectory with a Git subdirectory in there somewhere else in the world. And this can be a machine on which you have SSH access, a machine on which you have uh, web access, like HTTPS access, for example, a machine on the web that has a Git uh, 
protocol activated, like GitHub, for example, or CISA has a GitLab server that you can use. It's the same thing as GitHub with slightly different naming conventions, like instead of having a pull request, you have a merge request, but that's pretty much it. You can still do the same things. And what you can actually see very often are the remote names, so the names of the repositories, which you can actually inspect on the machine, and we will do this right now, they are either prefixed by SSH, by HTTPS, by Git, file, rsync, FTP, so on and so forth. Each one of these has different properties. We will be working with the Git or with the SSH or with the file. So file, local thing, Git, remote thing, SSH, remote thing. And I'll show you how to do this in a think file. And only some of this allow you to do both pull and push. So for example, with HTTP, you cannot do a push. Okay, so let's go and do some examples. So for the next part of the lecture, what I will be assuming is the following. You have access to the collaborative science web page and you have access to the Git Playground Have realized it closed, uh, yes, absolutely. Let me close the lines. Okay, let's go to Git Playground. So if you go to this address over here, you can find it in my repository on GitHub. So this is the repository that I would like you to use. So if you have never ever used Git before, before, before you can do anything, so if you go to the notes and look at one git md, there's a little bit of instructions about what you should be doing. The, the very first thing that you should be doing is to tell git who you are and what is your email address. So let me just make this a little bit larger. And this is done by issuing these two, these two comments. Okay. If you do that, what this is going to do is the following. It's going to create a git config file in your home directory, okay? That contains at some point the definition of your name and email, right? So for me, that is the user is Luca Helpe and the email is lucahelpe at sister.it. So this identifies me on git on GitHub, on any commits as the author of the various commits that I'm going to be doing, okay? There's a lot of other things that I do here. Like for example, I have an alias list because I used to come from, from Subversion. So Subversion had shortcuts that were called CO and CE for checkout and commit, okay? But this is just uh, me. I like to write two letters things like uh, C O B R C I S T W L. I'll try to spell everything out. So I will try not to use these shortcuts in this particular lecture because otherwise you're going to get confused because you don't have those things. But there's also very uh, nice things. For example, here I use also, I have a, a git w diff, which I think is very useful. If you look for word diff on Google, colored word diff on Google. This gives you a version of diff, which is a version that only highlights words. And this is very useful if you do LaTeX and you have one long line in which you changed one single word and you try to figure out what is the word that you've changed and that's impossible to see unless you actually uh, you know, make uh, the words show up in your diff tool. So this is, for example, one of the things that I will be showing to you very soon. Okay, so let's start by assuming that you have done git config, right? Git config minus minus global. And you can do that as name equal your name and your address. This is a short shortcut of what I showed you before. This can be done in both by setting both the username and the email address. Okay, so if you do that, now, I'm not hitting enter, I just had control C, so that this is not, was not executed since I already have set up all of those. 
everything that you do after now will be okay. If you don't do that, if you try to do anything, anything like a commit, it will tell you, I cannot do that because I don't know who you are. Okay, good. Now the comment that I would like you to issue to start with, let me remove the Git playground and let me start from scratch is, I would like you to start cloning my repository. So the remote repository that we have that I've shown you there. So you can go here on the Git playground and copy this. If it's SSH, that means that you have added an SSH key to GitHub. You can do that to allow GitHub not to ask you for username and passwords all the time. Otherwise, you can use HTTPS. This will ask you for your username and password whenever you do a action on this repository or on any repository on GitHub. So my suggestion would be, would be to use SSH. Do you know how to create a key? SSH key and to publish an SSH key on GitHub? Question mark? No, very good. So before we start, let's do that. The way that I would do this is SSH key gen should be a application that you have at your disposal on the terminal. Okay. And you can call it, uh, let me say that this is a, a user cell type instead of calling it ID RSA, ID RSA for GitHub lectures. Lectures, for example. If I do that, what is going to happen is that it's going to ask me for a passphrase and I'm going to use an empty passphrase. So I don't want to have to enter anything when I do that. And this is now, generated two keys. One is the private key, and the other one is a public key. Uh, why is this useful? Whenever you use an SSH protocol, you can verify the identity of the person by trying to do some cryptographic algorithm that will succeed if and only if you have a public key and a private key that match. So the idea is you give the public key to the uh, server where you want to connect to, and when you connect, the server will try to test whether the private key that you have matches the public key. So it's like a key and a key lock on the door. So if you have the right key, you can enter. If you don't, you cannot. So you can share the public key with anybody. Never ever give away this, the private key. So the private key is actually the key that you would use for, uh, I mean, it, it's the, the physical key. So if you give that to somebody else, they can, they can log in to anywhere where you save the public key, okay? Now, once you have that, you can open this directory and locate that file. I have several of those guys already. So you will see uh, for githublectures.pub, I have that, but then I also have a github rsa.pub. So this is my original public key. If you want to have, once you have created that, you can go here and there should be on the profile, there should be a settings. And on the settings of the profiles, you have SSH and GPG keys. You can go to the SSH keys over here and you will see all the keys that are available on my GitHub account. So for example, I have a key for this computer that is called Turbolo. I used to name all my computers uh, after fictitious seven dwarves. Uh, things. So I had Stimolo once, I had uh, Buffalo, and I had uh, Tubolo. Tubolo is a fast computer. I also had uh, <laughs> Nimolo, which was the one that actually see it all the time. And I have one on Marconi, and I have one on Ulysses, and so on and so forth, so that I can always pull and clone all of my uh, remote machines, right? On my remote machines without having to add things. So if you want to do that, so what you can do is you can add a new SSH key, and if you don't say any title here, this is uh, going to be abstracted from the key itself. And then the, the thing to do here would be to just cat that and copy it. So you should copy the content of the key itself here. If you add that, GitHub calls key, 
Oh, it will ask me for password, which it's too long for me to remember. So I have this guy here. And so now I should have GitHub course key password here. It's never been used yet. Okay. And um, at, at this point, the way to proceed would be to tell SSH that whenever you connect to GitHub, you want to use that public key, the one that you've just created. Or if you decided not to create a new one, you just pass your public key and it will be the one that you actually use by default, which is this ID RSA PAM, uh, sorry, uh, RSA PAM, which is the one that is used by default for the system. So if you already have that, ID RSA PAM, you can use that. Otherwise, you, you can use uh, the, 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 new, the new one. And I can, you can change which one is the key, the key that is used by GitHub. Uh, now I don't have it here, of course, because here I'm using Turbolo and Turbolo is this guy over here. Uh, you, you can tell which key to use. Um, Oh, I don't have an example here. So let me let me take an example place where I do actually have an example. There should be somewhere here, an example in which I tell what is the key that I'm using on the config file. Not here. So let me search on Google. Okay, so how to specify what key to use SSH config? Uh, let me go. There's an identity file keywords that you can use here. And you just use ost github.com and put identity file, the identity file that you just created. Let me make this a bit larger. So if you set host, let me do this on my current machine. So I have on SSH uh, config file, I do host github.com, uh, host and this would be Host name is the same as the, as before. So I, if you don't say anything, it will just use the GitHub the GitHub.com name. Uh, user is Git, and identity file is SSH. For example, if I remember that that was ID RSA um, GitHub course, maybe. I remember lectures. Lectures. GitHub lectures. So this would be host name uh, github.com. So if I now try to do a git clone on the collaborative, uh, sorry, on the um, latest repository that I have here, which is the Git Playground. And I copy that. So I know that the, the user is Git because it's Git at, okay? So this is the, the way that they instruct you to use that. So the username is Git. And if I try to do that, it will tell you um, no such identity. So I probably got the wrong name. <laughs> I have four GitHub lectures. Yeah, sorry, that was wrong. So I can do again the ISSH config, and this is actually four GitHub lectures. Okay. And now, as you see, it tried to use that. And if you added that to the 
SSH, SSH public key here. If I reload this page, you will see that GitHub course key has been used recently. Okay. And now this has allowed me to do the clone. And since GitHub knows me by my name, I'm also allowed, if I have access on this repository, I'm also allowed to push to this repository. Okay. Okay, so what has happened now? If you do the clone, then there's a, there's a directory that is called the Git Playground, which is this guy over here. And the Git Playground, if I recall correctly, should be right over here. So let me close this and open it again because I had deleted it. So go to code minus and here you should be seeing my the, the, the files that are over here. There's a readme file with a not matching there. Okay. And now if you look at the, the history of this guy, I only have one commit, which is the initial commit that I did this morning at 14th of October. And you can actually see that also on the history that you have here. So you can go at the insights and there should be a network. Yeah. And there's only one dot, the initial commit with the SHA-1 that you see there. 1C03B1D, and the owner of that commit is me. Okay. Questions so far? So, how do I see on what repository I'm working on? As you see, I have a uh, I have information that shows up on on my on my terminal whenever I hit enter. Okay. This is a configuration that I have for ZSH. You can download your favorite one. There's many of them available for you. And in particular, I, since I use Git basically everywhere, my home directory is under Git. All the configuration files that I use is, are under Git. Uh, all of those, I mean, of course, I'm not uh, committing all the binary files. I'm just committing all the files that are, that are text files, C++ files, LaTeX files, CV files, whatever. Okay. All of those are under version control. And so I'm, I'm, I always need to know where I'm at, in what branch I'm working on. So this is particular saying to me, I'm working on the main branch and what is the SHA-1 commit that I'm working on, okay? So if you look at this, this is exactly what this is telling me. So this is 1C03D1D. So I'm sure that I have the exact same copy that is currently on that commit on the web. Okay. If you have done the clone, this is exactly what you should get. And you can ask for that by looking at the branch command. If you don't say anything with the branch command, it will just tell you where bra what branch you are in and what is the name of the branch you're in. So the star here tells you where is the head branch, where, where's the head uh, of your current work tree, meaning what will be um, where which branch will be advanced when you make a new commit, okay? So remember, the branch is just a named tag, a tag well, not a tag, uh, it's a named reference attached to a commit. And uh, if this is attached to the head commit, whenever you commit a new thing, this head will just move forward and follow where you are, okay? So if I ask with minus V, for example, try that with branch minus V. What I get is it will tell me that this is my initial commit. It will tell me the short message of the commit, which is here, and it will tell you exactly what is the SHA-1 of that commit. Okay. If you want to know more about it, you can do git log, and this will tell you exactly what has happened to the repository. And this, of course, just one commit. So you can see this is a, it will contain also longer information, but it tells you actually who's the author and when the commit has been done. And this is available graphically with a lot of tools. So there's one that is called source tree, which is very nice. I would suggest you to use one of those tools to understand what is a graphical version of things. If you have Visual Studio Code, for example, there is a tool that is called um, VidGraph that you can install. And this is exactly doing ex what, what, I, what I show here to use Visual Studio Code. If not, uh, source tree 
is a good application. So here, for example, I can choose that and import it in source tree. Say, for example, in summer here. And it's of course not a Git LaTeX thing, so it doesn't really matter. But let me open this, for example. This is how it would look like. Okay? And the, the reason match to show here, simply because if you look at the branches, the main branch only contains one commit. If you start committing things, you would see here the graph growing with, with the list of the commits on the right hand side in a pretty much the same way that you actually see it here. So just to show you this on a real application. So for example, if I go to the deal to library, which is the one that I was discussing with you the other day and look at the graph of this guy, well, the graph of this guy is much more complicated and much more intricate. Okay. But as you see, there's always a commit between, so the, 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 between one commit and the other commit on the branch, on the main branch, which is this one that you see here, here is actually called the master branch. Uh, the, the history is almost linear in the sense that this is rebased on top of the latest version. There's a few commits on the bay on, on, the, on the branch, and then this is merged back to master. Okay. This is as linear as it can possibly be when you have four branches which are merged every day. Okay. So this is roughly, you, you will see three, four branches that, that head off from the same starting point, and then they are merged one after the other without debating them in this one. And uh, some of them are very long running, but then before they are merged, they usually they are rebased, right? But some, some of them are not. So for example, here there has been one, two, three, four, five merge requests on the same day, 8th of October. So one, two, three, four, and five, all of these are merge requests which have been merged on the same day, okay? So this is going to be the most difficult uh, example that I will keep in mind, that you should keep in mind for, for these types of uh, branching and merging and stuff. And now we will start working on our uh, example. So let me, uh, let's start with, uh, with, with an exercise, okay? And source tree, yes. And you just open a directory that contains a git subdirectory that you've checked out, and it will show you the graphical version of it. Or if you're using a, an editor like Visual Studio Code, then git graph is what we'll be using here. And this shows up. So you can, you can actually install a lot of git tools for, for Visual Studio Code. And this is in the extensions. So if you search for git, on the extensions of Visual Studio Code, it will show you Git history, Git lens, Git graph. So these are the three that I've installed. Uh, I think Git lens is probably the best, the, the, the most powerful one. So with Git lens and Git graph, you're you're good to go to do all sorts of stuff. And as soon as as soon as you have installed those guys, there is going to be a little symbol here on the left, which is called source control. And with this, you can do a lot of things related to it. Okay. So let me let me try to to do that. So let's let's start by doing something related to Git to the related to the exercises that I would like you to do today. Okay. So let's start. And what I will be doing is the following: I will create a directory. Okay. And I will create a directory with uh, let's call it lab zero one. Okay. Don't do that yet. I will do it for you. And in this directory, I will, cre I will create a file, which is, you should do the same. So you should create the directory and create a file which you're, with your name, surname, dot txt. And here, I would like to say, um, I would like you to write one thing that you have done in your, during the quarantine, that you had never had the occasion to do before. Like uh, something that, uh, that during the lockdown, uh, you were very happy about. One phrase, like for example, I got to play a lot with my daughter. Okay. And uh, the format of this, I would like to 
you, know, you, you, you put a couple of lines before, after that, and then you write your name and surname. Okay. Just as an example of things. So now I have a file that is called lucahelte.tech, deep steep. Okay. If I'm working alone, so if this is the only person that is working on this, the way that I would proceed is I would add this file under source control. So git add lucahelte.txt will tell git, look, from now on, you have to know what happens to this file. If you don't do that, git will ignore this file. Right? Git ignores anything that you don't tell it to acknowledge. It doesn't do things on your back, which means it's often tedious to instruct it to add all the files that you used. So you can add the directory that contains all the files if you want. That's faster in a sense, but it will not do things without telling you. Some versions that would just do add everything that is in there. If you commit and it doesn't know a file, well, just add all of it, who cares, okay? Okay, so once I've added the file, what, what it's going to happen, you see here, something has happened. So it says to me, staged changes on the top left. If you don't have this, so if you only have the command line, what you will see is that git status, the output of this status will tell you, you are on branch main, which is up to date with origin main, okay? And the changes to be committed are a new file, which is called lucahelte.pc. Okay. I got to play a lot with my daughter. Okay. Let me say that I don't want to write this in English, in a bad English, and I say I had the occasion to play a lot with my daughter. And I'll save. What you will observe here, if you if you look at the status of the file now, there's two things showing there. One is a green guy and one is a red guy. The green guy is what I have staged before. So Git does not in any mean do things without you telling it to do. So I have changed the file, but I did not tell Git that what I've changed should have gone, or should have been committed in any way. And I haven't committed yet. So there is a difference between the staging area and the working area. So the difference is, the working area, so the, what, what is the current status of the file, could have, could have had nothing to do with the staging area. And if you look at here, how they look like, the staged changes are, I got to play a lot with my daughter, which is what I said before. So I said before, add lucahelde.txt, that means I'm telling you Git, now what is the status of the file? This file should be as it is right now, stored and, and be ready to be committed. Now you do that with all the files that you have. And then if you make changes to the files or if you make changes to part of the file, you can still do that without committing those changes. Okay. This is important to keep, to keep in mind. And of course, it tells you that there's page changes here, but there's also changes here, which are not committed and are not scheduled for commit. Okay. If you want to do this graphically and you just click here, this will stage those changes, meaning, it will execute git add lucahelte.txt. So if you now look at the git status, you still go back to the same status as before. So there's just a green light here saying, this is a new file. And now this is what I'm going to be committing. Is it clear? I haven't committed anything yet. So this commit is not there yet. I just staged it to be committed. So th this double stage is unique to Git and to Mercurio, for example, but not to Subversion. So in Subversion, when you commit, you commit. That's it, finished. There's no stage area. So if you want to do that, you have to work around a little bit if you want to replicate the same type of behavior on Subversion. Okay, so let's do the commit. Git commit, and now added Luca's description. I'm oh, sorry, Lu, this Luca description. as usual, yeah, okay. Now what happens if you look at the graph of this, now all of a sudden 
I have another commit. Okay. This commit is not on the web server yet. Indeed, I have not tell I have not told the web the web server that this commit should be taken into account. So if you look here, the latest commit, which is here, is still the one that I had one hour ago. So 1C03B1B. Okay. If I want my commit to go to the server, what's the command that I should be using? Git push. Yes. Okay. So now we start with the complicated stuff, right? So where is it going to be pushed? Question one. So if you don't do anything, it may complain or may not, depending on the version of Git that you have and how you configured your Git. So if I do Git push, well, it doesn't seem to have complaints. Maybe if you clone the, 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 the repository, it will not do the same thing that, I, that it shows you. The reason why this may be different is for that. When I cloned the repository, I mean, I have this configured in such a way that uh, if I have a local branch that is called main and I do git push, it will automatically push on the remote branch that has the same name if that branch exists. If it doesn't exist, you have to tell it explicitly. And when you pull or push, you have to tell explicitly from what branch to what branch you want to push or pull. Okay. So this command is identical to say git push origin master. Okay, so what is this comment that I'm here? So the origin, which is this guy over here, identifies the repository on which I want to push or the remote repository on which I want to push. So how do I see the remote repositories? Let me introduce you the remote command. And if you look at the remote command, remote, tells you what are the local, the remote repositories that have been registered to work in synchronization with this repository. If you have cloned the repository from me using SSH, this is exactly how it would look like, okay? Okay, if you have a GitHub account and you should do, you should. Now, I would like you to go here and hit on this, look, I have the Git playground, Hit the fork button okay, and fork this repository. So what does the fork mean? Fork is just a clone of the repository. It's a remote clone of the repository. Okay? So it creates a new repository in your GitHub account, which is a clone of this repository. Okay? So it's now an exact copy of the current repository that it's here. Okay? on your remote GitHub account. And now I want you to start playing with this remote repository. So how do you do that? You could clone that repository in a new directory. Once you have forked it, I cannot fork it because it's my own. So, I mean, it would tell me where do you want to fork it, okay? So I, I, I'm assuming that you have done this. If I do the fork, it will ask me, do you want to fork it somewhere somewhere else? Right? So I, I, cannot, I don't want to do that because otherwise I'll have messed up a lot of stuff. But I'm seeing that some of you did, right? So I have four people that have actually forked it. Yep. So I see all of those guys here, right? Right at the moment. Now, say that uh, I'm, I'm K Bidris, okay? And now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to clone this locally in the same repository. So I want what? I want to be able to push to that repository. And since they are perfect copies, I don't need to create a new directory with that new repository. What I need to do is just to add a new remote. Okay? So git remote. If you do help, it will tell you a lot of the things that you can do with the remote command, right? So one of the things that you can do is you can add a remote. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a remote. And if you look at the command, it tells you, and you can ask what branch, what master, tags, not tags, mirror, blah, blah, blah. But then the last things, which are the mandatory arguments are the name and the URL of the repositories, okay? 
So if I look at that, I will do git remote add kbridis, 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 sorry, student. <laughs> Easier. Okay. So git remote add student that, okay, nothing seems to have happened. But now, if you ask what are the remotes that you have, I have two remotes now. One is called origin. And the other one is called student. Okay, so from now on, if those refer to the same repository, I am able to synchronize those two. I am able to push and pull if I have rights permissions on those guys. Okay, so now what I would like you to do is I would like you to swap the names of the remotes. So find a way to do that. So Git remote help will help you. I would like you to have your origin remote point to the fork, your fork of my repository. And I would like you to rename the current origin uh, repository to the, let's call it, uh, I don't know, course repository. Okay, so there should be a comment here, origin. And I will want to, I want to rename the origin to say course. Blah, blah, blah. Now, if you are familiar with Git, then you know exactly what are the, the four dots that you should put there. If you're not familiar, just ask for help. Meaning git remote help, and it will tell you what is the command that you have to issue in order to rename a remote. Did you manage to do that? So let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. All right. So I'm trying to do some 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 stuff here, but the initial part is going to be slow, and then we're going to be moving very fast. Yes. Did you manage? Yes. Okay. So in the meantime, I will do here git remote help, and leave it here for a second. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, good, good. So you might have guessed, I asked you to rename remote, and this is the name. I mean, names in Git that you are, are sometimes difficult to understand if you don't know what they're trying to do, but this is an easy one. So let's do Git remote rename and then origin, and I call it course. Now, if I do git remote minus v, I will see a course remote repository and a student repository. And now, pretending that I am this student, what I will do is I will git remote rename student origin. Okay. And now, the reason why I did this is every branch and every push and pull that you do is attached to a specific remote. Okay? So you have to tell git push or git pull where to push from, where to push to, and where to pull from. Okay? So if I now do git push, it should do the same thing as before, but to the repository that is now called course, because it, it kept track of the fact that I have named the repository. Uh, if, if you want to make sure that things work on the uh, course repository, you can do git setup string set. Uh, so git pool, and then there's a set upstream origin main. Okay, so this is now telling me I'm doing from GitHub keep readers because I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it the other way around, of course, because I, I am the one that owns the master guy. But now what's going to do here, it's, it, is, it has set the upstream repository for this current branch as the origin remote on the main branch. Okay, so from now on, if I do pull and push, it will do that on the kbridis, kbridis. 
I could have chosen an easier name to pronounce, sorry. <laughs> it's very bad. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. My surname is even worse, so probably for everybody else, it's, it's the same thing, so um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, so um, let's go forward, and let me, let me set this back to whatever I had before. So git rename student origin, I want to do git remove, uh, sorry, git remote minus v. Now I have git playground origin is this guy. So I git remote remove origin and I git remote rename course origin. And now if I did pull, ah, this is the error that you could have seen at the beginning. It tells me I have no tracking information on the current branch. Please specify what you want to do. And if you wish to set tracking information for this branch, you can do so by git branch setup string to blah, blah, blah. Okay. And or you could do git pool minus minus set upstream, which is the same thing. It, it pool and it sets the upstream to origin thinking main. Okay, now I would like you to do the following thing. Uh, if you now look at this, there's a lab one with my description. I would like you to add your file and commit your file to your repository. Okay. And please do so on a branch, which is not the main branch. Okay. So let's start by doing things in the correct way. So let's say that I want to do a, a new branch and check out that new branch. So the way that I would do this is git checkout minus B. And now I call this feature or you can call it your name, or you can call it whatever, it doesn't matter. Give it a name that is uh, sensible with respect to what you're doing. And say, for example, here, git checkout minus B description of lockdown, I'm just being verbose, more than, more than verbose, of lockdown things, okay? And as you see, what has happened from the graphical point of view, and you can see this on the top, is that now there are three tags. One is the main tag and the origin head tag. And then there's a description of lockdown things branch. Okay, this one is in bold face, meaning if you ask git branch, you will see that now there's two descriptions, there's two branches, which all point to the same commit. So they are exactly in the same status at the moment. I haven't added any other commit. And here in these two branches, there's one that has a star that tells you where is the a local working branch and where is your head? So the head will follow that branch. Is it clear? Now, in this particular case, what I would like to do is I would like to create a new file called Pinco Pallino. And Pinco Pallino is a guy that was much more productive than I was. And during the lockdown, uh, I have learned to play guitar. Okay? And I sign myself, Pinco Pallino. Now, if I look at the status, Pinko Pallino is here, but it's unknown to Git. And so Git tells you this is an untracked file. If you want Git to know about this file, you add the file. And after you have added the file, Git status will tell you, green light on that, there's a new file, and uh, this is a change to be committed. So it's not a change that has been committed. So Git tells you a lot of the things that it does, and it tells you so in a very verbose way. So if you look at it and you listen to what it says, well, it tells you exactly what's going to be committed next time, okay? And it tells you also how to remove those. So for example, if you don't want to do that anymore, you can git restore minus minus staged file. We'll just unstage that file. So it will not delete it. It will just make sure that it's no longer staged for commit. Okay. Now let's commit that and let's say I commit Pinko Pallino description. 
And now I git push origin. Uh, before I push, let me show you the graph and let me show you how the graph has moved. Okay? So now, if you look at the main branch, the main branch is left where it was before. That's the SHA-1 where it was before. While the head branch, which is not shown, so the head is not shown here, but it's uh, the bold face character in this particular case. So if you look at the, at the uh, source tree uh, interpretation instead, we have to hit play down here. That should be um, here. Well, it's the uh, same, same notation. So it uses the bold face to indicate what is the current branch in which you are at. And it says that the main on the origin is here and the head on origin is on that commit. Okay, so here, origin main, main and origin head all point to the same commit. These are all references to point to the same commit, which is the same thing that you should have if you have cloned and pulled from my repository. Okay, if you're still here, it means you have not pulled latest changes from my repository, you can pull them and they will be inserted on top of main. Okay, now let's say that I want to somehow merge this guy into main. And how do I do that? So there's two ways. Either from the command line, I can merge on the master. Okay, or now I'm going to teach you how you should do that on larger community. Okay, so on larger communities, what happens here, you reload that. Now there's this, this branch is even with Luca Health AMA, that's perfectly fine. And now I would like to push my branch, which is a description of local, uh, the local branch description of local of lockdown things to origin on the branch called description of lockdown things on origin. Okay. So git push takes the remote on which I want to push and the branch on which I want to push, and it takes the current branch as a um, indication of where to start or, or what you want to actually push. If you want to push some other branch, you can add it here. So if you don't say anything here, it will use a branch where you're sitting at. So you can actually push another branch from a different branch. Okay, so the push is much more flexible with respect to that, okay? So just type git push origin, what? Uh... It, uh, I mean, if it's uh, configured to do uh, the correct thing, it will push the current branch on a branch named with the same name on origin. Okay. So if you don't say anything, it will push the current branch on a branch with the same name on the default remote, which is the one that is currently being tracked, which is the, the origin. And now you will see here, this is the first thing that, uh, that, that, that the first new thing that we will be doing. So create a pull request for description of lockdown things on GitHub by visiting this link. Okay. If I actually click on this link, what's going to happen is that there is going to be a open pull request comment and the pull request is going to be titled with the title of the last commit that you have over here. Okay. Now here, I want to merge something okay and if you look at this the default pull request is created on the base of the original of the original repository where everything started from and from the base from from the branch where you're actually looking at okay if you have cloned your repository this one should be my repository Okay, so try to do that. I create the pull request. Okay, and now we will try to understand what is happening here. And as you, as you see, what has happened on GitHub is that there's now a section which is called pull request, and one section is called Pinco Pallino, which is the one that I've created. And if I wait long enough, there will be a few more. Yes, add a personal new skill for Mohat Kamlich. Is that correct the way they spell it? Mohat Kamlich. Yes, Mohat Kamlich. And uh, for example, here, I can go in there 
And I will see that you have added one commit, and this is exactly the same number that it is on your computer, if I'm correct. And this commit that you see over here is represented by a little dot with this SHA-1, and it contains one file change in the directory lab01. Let's see if the directory has the same structure. Yes. I started doing yoga. That's very nice. Me too, by the way. <laughs> All right. I can do several things at this point. I'm the owner of the main repository, and I'm the only one at the moment that can actually write on this repository. And this will be often be the case if you have large, uh, large communities. What happens is that you usually have principal developers of a code, source based code or whatever, that are allowed to write on that repository. And then you have a lot of contributors. If you want to contribute, to a repository that is not yours, you have to do so by opening pull requests. If you look at the main guidelines, they will tell you, open a pull request starting from the latest version of master, and then the review will start. I'm reviewing the changes and I'm saying, okay, uh, let me do this. And let me say, leave a comment. And the comment is, please add a dot at the end of the line. Okay. And then start a review. And I will say at the end of this, I just need to do that. So I finish my review and say, I approve provided you make that little change. Okay, and I approve that. So I make my review. You will see, you will receive an email, okay? That, that tells me, that tells you what I would like you to do on the code. And so, for example, this is the way that I work with my PhD students. They make a, they make a pull request on a, on a tech file. I look at the tech file. If it's okay, I merge it. If it's not, I say, okay, maybe this could be changed. Maybe we can move that or or maybe I do it myself. So I merge and then I open a branch in which I do all of the things. Okay? So once this change has been approved, I can actually merge the pull request. I will wait for you to do that. So I will wait for you to actually add the point and commit the thing. And in the meantime, I look at the other pull requests. And there's still just one. So all of the other students are either lost somewhere. No, I'm okay, but before I lost the, um, the SSH part, so I, I uh, created the SSH key. Yes. I put it on, uh, I don't know, my GitHub uh, account settings. Yes. But then it didn't match the, the second part. So I cloned using, using the. Uh, Okay, so you can do, you can change, you can change. So git remote minus v, you can do git remote change, or oh, set URL, sorry, set URL origin, and then you, you, you do that and just replace my name with your name. Uh, then I was trying to push to your repository. Uh, I don't know. Maybe if you cloned your repository, if, if you, 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 you can do that as long as you, uh, you log in every single time you do a push or pull. Yeah, yeah. It's but very annoying. Since I'm trying to push and pull to your... It's not going to work. So you have yeah, to push yeah. and pull to mine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I need to, I would need your, your account for this. No. On my own. Your own. So if you have forked the repository, yeah. did you create a copy of the repository? Yeah, but then I set, I left the origin your repository. I mean, I renamed mine, but then I put back your. Repository. Ah, okay. So if you still have your repos re remote repository here, if you if you issue git remote minus v, you should see an, uh, two repositories. One which is called origin, and one which is called something else. Yeah, I because I thought we were working on yours. No, 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 keep yours, oh, okay. keep yours. So the origin should be yours and mine should be yours. Okay. And okay. one thing, I have a, a problem to, with, um, to push with the username and password, but uh, I have to set my username and my password of Git, GitHub. Uh, yes, your username and your password on GitHub. If I 
to yourself. Because you're trying to push to origin, not to, sorry, to course, not to origin. So ah. the, the essential thing here, you have to push to your copy of my repository, because you have right access to that copy, not to my repository. Is it clear? So let me make an example. Let me, let me go back to, we had some point, at some point I added a student, this guy, re remote ad student. Okay, so if I try to git push uh, student, this should say to me the same thing that it said to you. So if you look at that, it tells me, Permission denied, fail to push some rest to this repository. Okay. That means GitHub recognized that Luca Helta does not have write permissions to this repository. So what I can do, I can open a pull request to that repository, which is what I did before. Okay. So that's why I'm asking, I'm, I'm telling you to do this. If you want to do push directly to your branches, you can do that. If you want somebody else to collaborate with you without giving them right permissions to your files, what you can ask them is to open pull requests on your GitHub repository. So they can clone the repository locally or remotely, so they can fork. So the, 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 the thing should be, the, the steps should be the following. You fork the repository here, and this creates, the, so the remote repository. So you have somebody else's repository. Somebody's telling you, I want to collaborate, uh, you to collaborate with me. This is my repository. They either give you write access, in which case the repository is as yours as it is his, or they don't give you write access. If they don't give you write access, the only option that you have is that they merge your changes because they have write access. And so the process here is initialized by creating pull requests or merge requests uh, according to what system you're looking at. So GitHub calls them pull requests because it sees things from the perspective of this repository. So this repository is pulling changes from your repository in this particular case, okay? So let me see in the meantime, if, if there's a new commit. Yes, there is a new commit. Let's see what has changed. There should be a dot added there. Yes, you see? Now, I now approve this already. And now what happens, what I would like to do at this point is merge this pull request. And as you will see, I've now merged this thing into master and I have created a merge commit. Okay, so this is not a fast forward merge. If you look at the, at the network, as it would look like from here, now you should see there's Luca Heltai, okay? And this is my commit. This is Mohat Kamlich commit, same, fixing typo. And now I have merged it on my master. And as you see, the history of master is linear. So it's one commit after the other. So it's very easy to identify on master who introduced what problem, what bug, what whatever. However, there's always something that uh, jumps off from here and, and gets merged there, okay? Now I see here, there's Pinko Pallino as well, okay? And there is Ricardo Rende who is adding a text, okay? So I can actually go there and look at what, ha what has happened. And there's also, finally, <laughs> okay, please, okay. So if I look at this guy over here now, what I would like you to do is I would like you to open a pull request for that. And now there's Ricardo that actually opened the pull request. So this is not merged yet. I open Ricardo's changes and I look at that. So I look at the commits. There's only one commit, so this is okay, files changes. That's guy, okay. I started watching movies, nice. Um, I would like you to actually change that and say, um, well, I can do that directly here and say, please sign this below 
the phrase. So we know we know who you are when we merge all the parts. Okay. And then I can either start a review or add a single comment. I, I decided to add a single comment and actually to approve this. Okay. So this will happen many times in, the, in, in, in remote repositories that you have to have approval before you can actually merge, before somebody merges. Okay. So for example, in the DL2 repos repository, what happens is that every pull request that is initialized can be reviewed only by somebody else. So I cannot review my own pull requests. I am one of the persons with the right access to that repository, so I can merge everybody else's pull request, but I'm only allowed to merge if all tests succeed and if there is at least one person that accepts or that, is, that has reviewed the pull request. And you can see that in the, lab, in the, in the GitHub repository of DL2, if you look at the pull requests, and go to the deal to repository. It's an example that I know very well. That's why I, I use this as an example, right? So here, for example, tests are run at every time and there's nine of 12 checks that are okay. The other ones are not. So this cannot be merged no matter what. And there's a lot of comments and things, but you see there's a lot of those guys that are actually green. They are still waiting for somebody to review. For example, one could go there and, and, and take a look at this and decide whether this can be merged or not, right? So typically the way this works, you see the comments here, right? So there's a number of comments there, which means somebody actually did the review. So if you go there, right? This master line said, otherwise looks okay to me. So he has like a few comments that he has created. And then he said, okay, you should try to do uh, these changes and so on and so forth, exactly as I'm doing with you guys, all right? So somebody tells you what to do, they, you, you do that, or you, you say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not okay with this, I won't do this because of that, and so on and so forth. Once everybody is okay, this is approved, you wait for the test to pass, and then everything is ready to be merged. Okay. Is an example of Yes, let's do that. So let's create a conflicting merge. So you can try to do something like a conflicting merge, so let's see whether Ricardo actually managed to do that. <laughs> Sorry. So let's go. If there is another pull request here, there's Pinko Pallino here. Uh, sorry. Yes. I have a problem of uh, authentication fail for, uh, and uh, I don't know why. I it's uh, ten minutes that I try. I I insert the username and the password, but uh, always a uh, authentication failed and I don't know why. Uh, so this this happens at the level of the git push? Yeah. So the git pool has worked? Uh, from, sorry, from maybe my... I've lost something and I uh, did the wrong all because I uh, only did the git clone. Okay, so if you, what is the output of git remote minus v that you see? So you should have two yeah, repositories. I have two origin, my GitHub repository, git playground dot git. One okay. fetch and another push. Okay, so it's the same thing that you see on the screen at the moment. So it's like that with your name instead of mine. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And this is with Git or with HTTPS? HTTPS. Okay. Can you change that to this format by setting Git remote set? Uh, I think it's set URL origin. And then you uh, change the first part of Git uh, with the, with the Joshua. Which of the Joshua? <laughs> at, sorry, git at github.com and then column your name slash git playground dot git. Yes. So in the meantime, I would like the the one of you guys, or all of you guys, that has not done the pull request yet, 
Uh, if you go to the insights and look at the network, you will see that all of those pull requests now will start from this commit. Okay, let's pretend that you have had the time to actually take a look at this, uh, at this repository. And now you know that the policy of the repository is to only accept commits or accept pull requests that are rebased on top of master. So please rebase your commit on top of master. How do I do that? Question mark. So in order to make the pull request, you can go to your home, to your, uh, to your repository, okay? And it should show you, if you look at the, the main repository without that, it should show you here a few branches here, and there's a possibility to do a compare and pull request for you. And for me, it doesn't allow me to do a pull request because I don't have write access on your branch. So you can initiate, can initiate the pull request. I can merge it, but I cannot do the opposite. So I can just compare. I can just look at it and say and see what happens. Okay. And, and so I'm, I'm, I went to the wrong guy. So I didn't, I didn't go to you. I think I went to. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's go here. I'm a description of lockdown things, okay? And now if I look at the status here, everything is clean. And if I look at the history, I've added Pinco Pallino to the wrong branch, okay? Let me tell you what I mean by the wrong branch. Let's show how if I, uh, okay, it did actually update without me doing anything. If you look at this, what, what, what has happened here, I went to, uh, there's, there's a few of those guys. So if I git fetch minus minus all, git fetch just fetches all the information from the remote repositories. Okay. So for example, here now, I see also the changes that were done by Kevidris. Hmm? And these changes here are, I think, uh, the one that come from this guy. Yes. And I see that you have made your changes to the uh, main branch, not to the key, to another branch. So I will ask you to create a new branch. So git branch, and give it an, another name, and then push that branch to your own repository, to your own remote repository. Okay. And if, as soon as you push the branch to your own remote repository, GitHub will tell you, do you want to create a pull request? And you can click on the link. Right. Now, what I would like to do here, I would like to, 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 to show you the fact that the description of lockdown thing started from origin and started from this guy over here, okay? This branch was merged by me at this point. Uh, sorry, uh, the first merge branch probably was Oh, I didn't do a branch, I just merged everything. Okay, so let me let me tell you what I, what I would like you to do at this point. Uh, you see that this branch, which is my description of lockdown things with Pinko Pallino, it's starting from a point in history, which I know is now old, okay? So the thing that I can do, if I look at the branch where I'm at at the moment, this is the branch of the description of lockdown things, I can rebase this branch, on origin master main. Or if I know that origin and main are the same level, I can rebase with respect to main. If I do git rebase with respect to main, nothing will happen. Why? Question. Look at the labels of the branches that you see there. Oops, I didn't do a commit for the pool in order to go to origin. Exactly. So if I check out the main branch now, so I'm currently on the on the log description lockdown things, right? You see that here, and you see that here from the fact that this guy is the one that is now old. Okay. 
I want to go back to Maine. And if I think that this would have, uh, would have pushed me on the origin Maine, so the one that is currently on the repository, I would be wrong. Something has happened in the repository in the meantime. So I have merged a pull request, which is the pull request number two from Mohan, right? And I'm, I'm also, uh, well, I, I just merged that guy, so I didn't do anything else, okay? So if I want to go back and, and synchronize main with origin main, which is this guy over here, what I should do is a git pull. If I don't do anything, it will do, uh, it will synchronize this with the branch that this is actually tracking. And at this moment, I think this is actually origin main. And as you see, the pointer has moved and it's, sa it's saying to me, updating from here to here, it's a fast forward, okay? And I would go just up there, okay? Question? Okay. If I had done some commits before doing the pool, what would have happened is that the git pool would have been a merge, would have initialized a merge. Okay, so be careful. If you pull something and you have commits, what's going to be happening is that it will download everything from the, from the repository remote and then create a commit, which is a merge commit between you and the remote repository. Be careful. Let's try to do this later on and then we will see how to behave in that case. You can actually ask to rebase your current branch to pass in as an option to pull the rebase option. So we will do this later on. So let's go here and let's try to understand what is happening. So I'm currently on origin main. And what I wanted to do was to go the description and to push this commit on top of the origin main instead of being here, okay? So the easiest way to do that is to go on the branch which you want to rebase, which is the description of lockdown things. Okay, now I am on that branch. So this is the bold, the bold one. So if I look at this guy over here, I only have Luca Helta and Pinko Bellino. Because on this branch, I have nothing. I, hadn't, I don't know anything about what you did here. And I don't know anything about what you did here. So this is a separate branch. Now, what I want to do is I want to move this little dot on top of this guy. All right. So let me copy here this SHA1. So let me copy the, the SHA1 here just to give you an idea of what happens afterwards. So, I want to be able to go back here and to show you that this is still there in history. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do git rebase origin master, which is now the same as main, sorry, not origin master, but origin main, which is the same as main, okay? Which is different from student main. I could, so I could have done this as git rebase main or git rebase origin main. Now, Let's see what, ha what has happened to this. Let me reload. Yes. Look, there's now a new commit that starts from main, that is description of lockdown things, which is this guy over here. And on the remote repository, there's still the origin description of lockdown thing, which is the branch that I pushed before that contains Pinko Bellino's changes on that branch. Okay, so now these two have different identifications. So this is 5683, five, three, and this is 39190, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I can get, I can get, I can still get there. So I can still get check out that guy. Okay, and now it will tell me that I am currently here. And you see that there is a little dot here without any attached branch. And, and there's, an, there's a warning that appears here that tells you switching to this guy, you are in the detached head state, meaning you're not attached to any branch. If you commit now, there will be a history here moving from this point to somewhere else, but you, this will be in, 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 in the emptiness. So you would not know who the father is, uh, would not know how to track those guys. So you could do that. 
But there's a, so the, the suggestion that they give you, if you really want to start editing from here, create a branch so that we can actually follow you while you are there, okay? And it says, you're in attached to see, you can look around, make experimental changes, commit them, because discard any commit you make in the state without impacting any branches by switching back to a branch, okay? Yes. So if I don't have like uh, the description of all of those things as a branch on origin, how can I um, check it out, let's say locally? You, you have to know it. the SHA-1. Uh, but uh, can I track the shell one even though I'm... Um... So you can, you can uh, analyze the history of what has happened in the, in the past. And okay. this is called... So reference. I want to see if... Um... Yes. Okay. So this, this, uh, this command is called git ref log and it gives you the log of all references that have, that have happened on, on the current command line. So it will give you the SHA-1 of everything that has happened in history since you started working on this repository. So it's not like git log. It's, uh, no, it's okay. git ref log. And uh, the difference is git log shows you what has happened in the branches. Git ref log shows you what has happened on the SHA-1 references. So any SHA-1 reference that, that has ever appeared in the repository is logged in the ref log. Okay, so if you want to know where to get a, a reference, if you know what is the name of the commit, or if you understand, if you move around and you know exactly roughly where you were, you can go back in history and, and, and tell exactly and do exactly what I was there. Okay. So let me now do the following. I am at the moment, I have rebased myself on top of this. And I want to eliminate origin description of lockdown things from history, right? I don't want origin to point to a different things with respect to me. These two guys now have the same name, but they point to different things and, and they're being evolved in different ways. So what you can do is you get, you check out the description. Or first of all, you should not push branches until you want to merge those branches or create pull requests. This is the idea. Right? If you do, then you should think about branches as disposable things, so you can delete them at your will. So it's really not important if you delete branches, and it's not it's, it's not a problem because you can always recover them at any time. And if you want to rename the same branch, so say for example, I, what I want to do now is I want to push origin and uh, without doing anything else. So if I do that, it should try to push the description of locking down things to the origin description of lockdown things. All right, so let's use the same thing. It, we should complain, okay? You should get an error if you try to do that. And the error that tells you, fail to push some refs to GitHub, blah, blah, blah. Updates were rejected because the tip of your current branch is behind its remote counterpart. Integrate the remote changes, for example, by git pulling before pushing again. So this is one suggestion. So the suggestion that it tells you is, look, you're in two different type of, uh, so you're not starting from the same tip. So this is the tip of this branch and that's the tip of the other branch. So these are not the same branches. You cannot push on there. If you really want to push them, you should merge these two points. Okay, this is not what we want to do because we wanted to rebase and then have a new pull request. So what you can do, you can do a git push force or minus minus force. This will eliminate origin description of lockdown things. So it will actually relocate this guy and make it pointed here. Now it's doing it and it's saying, okay, I've created that force updated. And if you look at the history at this point, your new commit starts off from main. Okay. Please do the same. So if I now did fetch, let me add the various name of all the histories that we have here. So let me add all of those guys. And I go to Git Playground and I go to the network insights. I go to the network 
And now I should see also Ricardo Rende. Okay, so I can git remote add Rende, and then I just copy paste my GitHub. Ricardo Rende, git playground. Uh, so if I git fetch now, it will fetch information only from the origin. If I do git fetch minus minus all, this command basically downloads everything without doing any merge or any pool or any, anything. it just updates all the, all the local repositories with everything else that we have remotely. So that now if I look at the source tree, I also have the rende repository. Now, what I would like you to do is I would like you to, as an exercise, the, all of you guys, you should rebase of the change that you have made to the repository on top of origin head or origin name. Okay. So exactly what I did with my pull request before with the Pinko Palino pull request. So the description of lockdown thing is now up to date on origin and here, and I will actually make a new merge request. So if you're not fast enough, you will have to do this again and again as an exercise, <laughs> right? So here I have two branches. This is the guy and I open this guy over here and there should be a pull request already. Since the pull request is open on this branch, it will follow the force push that I have. So this one will have just one commit which is the latest commit that I have here, which should coincide with this latest commit that I have here. Okay. Questions, yes. No, no. <laughs> okay. So the exercise is try to have linear history before you open the pull request, or if you have already opened the pull request, try to change it and make it such a way that you have a linear history. This is sometimes a request that developers ask you. So if you, if the pull request you open required, for example, three weeks of uh, modifications, at the end of these three weeks, the source code in master will have moved a lot. For example, in yield two, this happens a lot. So what happens usually is, please rebase on top of master and then we will merge. So if I git fetch minus minus all, I should now see some changes. If you have been fast, nope, not yet. So I have now the student here should be KBDs, KBDs, yes. And I should see somehow at some point those guys showing up, not yet. And in the meantime, I will do what I said we should not do. So I will merge my own request. <laughs> okay, now if you reload, so if you if you now make me reload this guy, you will see that the origin head will have changed and main origin will have changed, containing also the merge of the description of lockdown things. And my main will be behind with respect to the origin main. Is it clear? So we need to rebase now? Yes. With respect to origin main. Yes. Okay. So I've already I've already made a merge request to so fetch the changes on origin before you do that. Otherwise, you will end up rebasing with respect to this point. So if you don't fetch. Uh, Gita doesn't know that things have updated somewhere else. Okay. So now I'm trying to avoid conflicts, right? So I'm trying to avoid all sorts of merge request conflicts. We will, we will uh, deal with conflicts later on. Well. Um, because you don't have a remote repository now? No, um, because I, the same one I have like the, the comments. So you don't have my, the, the course repository? 
So you have two, right? So you have origin, which is yours. Okay, so you should add my repository, which is this, and add it as course. And then if you add it as course, then of course the rebase should be done with respect to course main and not with respect to origin main. Let me see whether, some, whether something has changed. Not yet. So I should have now, I have three, I have three repository, two repositories here. And let me see if, let's go here and let's take a look at the insights. There's eight forts. Ah, I see. Okay. Did you manage to do the push? Yeah, because now with GitHub, if you don't use the SSH, you need to generate a token. Ah, I see. And, uh, I didn't put the right settings for a token, so I couldn't access. I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. So I see Kamlesh V2. There we go. Somebody has done something. No, but uh, you didn't let me as a remote problem. The precisely. So let's go here, go to Git Playground, and then get that guy. Each remote add Mohad Cousin. Yeah. Yes, Mohad. Right. It fetch minus minus all. Yes, very good. So now I see Mohad has made a successfully rebased these changes on top of origin main. So now the, 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 the this commit is successfully here. I could merge this directly on main. If I merge this directly on main from the command line here, what would happen is that uh, this would be a fast forward merge, unless I explicitly ask not to do a fast forward merge. Okay? So this is, would be git checkout main. I would git pull origin main. This will, it's, now it's the same as, main, as, as doing git merge origin main. So the difference between git pool and git merge is that git pool is equivalent to git fetch plus git merge. Okay. And I don't want to do that automatically because I want to make sure that I debase instead of uh, merging whenever possible. So now my main is here and I would like to git merge minus minus no plus forward. And I would like to merge with respect to Mohad Kamlich version two. So this is exactly the same thing as hitting the merge button on the website. Okay. That's it. And as you see, now I have a new main, which is over here. And uh, you could safely delete this branch if you wanted to. Okay. And you see, history is now very, very linear. I will uh, just just to contradict myself a little bit. I will merge one of those guys without actually without actually waiting for you to rebase. So, for example, there's a this one. I guess. And if I look, oops, sorry, I closed too many things. 
So if I now look at this, I uh, can, for example, decide to do those merge without waiting for merge requests. Uh, I mean, the, the website for the pull requests is, is very convenient. No, there's another one. Let me see. I just merged? Yeah, on um, command line. Uh, because I didn't push that, yes. So if I push, I should be on master before I just push. Uh, on main. So if you push origin main. Now, if I reload this, this looks like merged. And so it's the same, well, it was exactly the same thing as it's in the button, uh, it's in the merge button. Okay. So let me let me just look at the network here. Okay. Now uh, I asked, so this is a sign, this is main. So okay, this this is the other thing that you didn't you didn't create a branch for that. Uh, so the ones with the with the branch, for example, I could make this a start of watching movies. So this was the sign, okay. So that you, for you, sign is signature, right? So I can merge that from the common line, which was uh, this one. Sign is signature, right? So you, you meant not as in plus or minus. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it, it's, it's it, okay. Okay. Now it's clear. I was for the same. So I didn't, I didn't realize that you had that. So let's merge that. Uh, git merge. Now, if I try to merge without fast forwarding, this is now equivalent because this cannot be fast forwarded. So if I merge this to main, so I'm currently on main origin, so I'm currently here, and I merge uh, rende lockdown, right? Now you see the graph has started looking similarly to what has happened to the deal 2 library, right? So there's a couple of branches that are long running, and there's some of those that are not long, not, not, not long running. And then here I have this one that has been done on May. Are you choosing the branch here? I still have the same problem. Okay. So let's. Uh, the, so the essential part here that I would like you to, to take home here is that if you do things by yourself, for your own self, having one single branch and committing on the single branch is enough to keep track of your history. If you are doing very simple things. As soon as you start experimenting, or as soon as you start doing things like, for example, I need to change something uh, which is urgent on, on a part of the code, and I don't want to touch another part of the program that I'm trying to do, then creating branches and experimenting becomes very easy and very comfortable. So that's the exact reason why you want to do that, right? So you open a new branch, you experiment a little bit, see whether that works, and if that works, you merge it back into mass. And in the meantime, if somebody asks you, oh, look, this doesn't work anymore, then you open a branch to fix the problem for that, and maybe you're left with this. So if you look at the, at the way that I'm developing this stuff, I can show you roughly uh, the, the, our development course. All right? And so these are the branches that are currently open for my own development. Right? So I have a lot of requests from users, from, from students to do some, to, to implement some features. And so I have several different copies of the same repository and several different copies that are created with working branches. And these are, for example, uh, features that I'm trying to do. These have to be names that are meaningful only for me. So I know exactly what they contain. And the development of this is extremely complicated. This is a very, very large library. So it's 150 megabytes of pure C++ code. And, and if you compile it, it's several hundred several hundred megabytes. So you don't want to be modifying things on the main branch. That's not what you want to do. So you want to make sure that the main branch is always in a perfect pristine state. So whenever you do any experiments, you do it on a separate branch. And if you think it's worth publishing, you make a merge request and you let somebody else take a look at what you've done. That's the idea. Okay. 
So this is take home message for today. Next lecture, which is next Wednesday, what we will be doing is we will actually uh, try to use testing environments on simple problems. Like for example, here, we will try to transform the files that you've just committed here. Please do all of the commits and all of the merge requests for this, rebasing on master, and then trying to keep up with the fact that uh, if I merge, it will be good exercise for you to merge again to rebase again on master. And what I will try to do is I will create a document, a LaTeX document, that contains everything that you said in a formatted way using a script. Okay. Now, the, uh, the outcome of next lecture will be, I want GitHub to check whether the, the tech file compiles every time I commit. Okay. And if it doesn't compile, I will not allow the merge request to succeed. Okay. And then I will ask you, okay, please commit an equation with an error and let's see how things are going in this particular case. So this is a typical use case. So you're collaborating with somebody, you create a LaTeX file, and you commit on the same file using different branches, different things. And then whenever everything is ready, one of the two or both of you merge on the master branch. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay. So we will try to do that. And we will also try to use git bisect. So this is the, the, the topic of next lecture will be testing and integrating the tests with git and GitHub. Okay. Good. Uh, any questions from people on Zoom? I mean, I'm, I know that there's a lot of things to take home here, but you have to experiment with this. So the, there isn't much that we can do in a couple of hours unless you really push yourself to experiment with this and use this uh, day to, on your day-to-day -day life. So my suggestion would be start putting every tech file that you have under version control. It's very useful. It's a very useful thing to do. So. Uh, just the tech, not the PDFs, so not the final results, just the source code. This is much, uh, much smaller. The images, uh, the data, and put them on under version control. You will be surprised how useful this is uh, in, 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 the next, uh, in the next months to come and years to come. I mean, I still have my own master thesis under, under version control, so I can, I can still see how my brain was developing very slowly during the period of my master thesis cycle. So this was uh, several years ago. Right? So transformed from subversion to Git, which is what happened next. Okay. So let me stop sharing. Let me stop the live stream. And let me take you, let me take questions if you have any.